truly believe in the magic. What's up, Magic fans? I'm Mikey, and welcome to a very special episode of Penny for Your Thoughts, the Orlando Magic UK podcast. Today is Monday, the 13th of December, 2021. As always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Geraint and Paul. Afternoon, boys. Paul, you well? Hi, how are you doing? Very well, mate. Very well, thank you. Good man. G? Excellent, yeah. Very excited for uh, this uh, podcast. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, today we are joined by a very special guest, former NBA point guard who played 757 games, including four years for the New York Knicks, three seasons for the Portland Trailblazers, TV analyst for NBA TV and Turner Sports, and father of Magic Guard Cole Anthony. So uh, welcome to the podcast, GA. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out and joining us. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to be on with you guys. Uh, would have liked to have been on after a, a win, obviously, but that uh, was not in the cards. But, you know, we, we showed some good signs uh, on this last road trip. And like you guys being a fan of the Magic, you you, you got to find the moral victories where you can. And so we, we've had a lot of those as the season progresses. Yeah, absolutely. So the Magic are coming off a uh, two two game Two games, uh, two losses in Los Angeles, uh, which we're going to break down on Thursday's episode when we jump back on. But we're going to leave that till until then. So, uh, GA, uh, obviously, this is a magic podcast, but I want to I want to kick off today. I want to find out uh, from you what was it like playing for the Knicks in the nineties, playing with the likes of Patrick Ewing, Charles Oakley, playing for Pat Riley. Yeah. Uh, what was it like playing at the Garden? Um, and what was it like getting drafted by the Knicks? What was that feeling like? And how did that compare to hearing Cole's name announced when the Magic drafted him last year? Uh, you know, that there are some similarities uh, between myself going there and my son. I, I was really fortunate and didn't necessarily quite appreciate how fortunate I was uh, not to play in the NBA. Obviously, I understood that. But to go from a Hall of Fame coach, Jerry Tarkanian, to you know, one of the all-time greats in Pat Riley. So I just thought that's how it was for everybody. You know, I thought everybody had great coaching and a great support staff. Uh, it wouldn't be until my fifth year in the league when I went to Vancouver where I realized that, man, you know, not everybody's a Hall of Fame coach. And so uh, that that part was uh, was an, an eye-opener. Uh, but it was, it was great because, you know, I grew up a Nick fan. Uh, you know, growing up in Las Vegas, I loved the Knicks and I loved the Lakers because those were the, you know, back when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have cable. Uh, so you didn't get a lot of opportunity to see these teams, but for the biggest stage. And so I was a huge fan of Pat Riley. You know, Magic Johnson was my favorite player. And so to get the opportunity to go and play for him was really, really amazing. And it was also, he was so similar to my college coach. It was really all about consistency. Uh, and and being tough mentally and, and your preparation and all those things. So it was a it was a ball to play there in that environment. It's still the best environment for basketball in, in the NBA. Uh, and I say that because they don't even have to be very good, but it's going to be sold out, and the fan base is really intense. And so uh, that experience was really cool uh, for me to to have both as a a player for the Knicks and even going back to compete against them. Uh, after I, I had moved on. That's great. No, we, we, Geraint and me have both been to the guard and we, we know what that was like. Unfortunately, we watched the Magic lose there as well. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a it's, great it's, place to go watch a game. Yeah, It's certainly on my bucket list. And uh, it's with the, the plan is at some point that we will do a tour with taking in the Magic at Boston and uh, seeing them at uh, the Garden and uh, playing against the Nets as well. So that's that's a plan. That's a plan for some point in the future. But I don't know if you hopefully, know. Hopefully you get that soon because, you know, in a couple of years, the Magic yeah. might end up being a hot ticket. Like right now, yeah. I, was, yeah. I was telling my wife last night at, at with the game in LA, I said, well, this is a night when all the Laker fans who don't typically get to go to the games will get to go because all the season ticket holders, they're looking, oh, it's a Magic at 5 and 22. All right, we're not going to that game. You know, those are the ones you tend to miss as a if you're a season ticket holder. Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's kind of where we are right now. You know, we're an afterthought as a, as a team, but in a couple of years, I think that's going to change. It's a, 
It will come. It will come. I don't know if you know, but on, as a previous guest on uh, the pod, we had uh, somebody from your draft last year. I know he went undrafted in Daryl Armstrong. Um, what? Who was the toughest player of your draft class to play against? Ooh, my draft class. That's a good one. Uh, Daryl was was a hell of a player. I, his energy and how hard he played was off, like off the charts. And the thing about the NBA and you don't realize this uh, until you get there, everybody's good. Like there was never, you, you just, anybody could give you third. That's just the way the league is. That's why, you know, anybody can beat you on any given night. And so it wasn't about who was the best. I mean, I would always look forward to playing against my, my college teammates. And those guys are great. Yeah. Uh, Larry was with Charlotte. Stacy was Atlanta. Uh, Elmore Spencer was with uh, the Clippers because he ended up going to play in the first round. And so those games were, would be would be tough because you know, look, you take pride. You want to beat those guys, and they want to beat you. Uh, but there was a lot of guys. Steve Smith was in that class, who was a great yeah. player. Uh, there just were a ton of guys that were really good, um, and you didn't. I didn't think of it that way. We we also had a different dynamic being with the Knicks. Like we were, Raleigh had us conditioned to look at the big picture. We were trying, you know, one to win our division back then, the Atlantic division, which we did, you know, the, the year prior to me getting there, they had, they were 31 and 51. So that my rookie year, we went 51 and 31, won the Atlantic and then ended up losing to the Bulls in seven. And so like we were focused on that. Uh, and so for me, as a young rookie, you know, I'm just in awe of the experience. And so I focus more on the history. Like my rookie year, unfortunately, was the year that Magic contracted HIV and he didn't play. And of course, I'm, you know, really looking forward to that. Larry Bird had a back problem. So all he would do is lay on the floor when we would play them. So I didn't get to play against him, you know. And so those are things that for me that I was like really excited to experience playing in Boston Garden. Uh, I was so pumped for that until I actually got to go there and see how just atrocious the facility was and the floor and all these <laughs> other things. Man. You had to go out and walk the whole court and dribble it. The coaches would tell me because they had so many dead spots. You know, you wouldn't even think of this nowadays, but their floor was wretched. And they would try to force you in the areas where they knew the floor was bad because the ball wouldn't come back to you. <laughs> things like that. And so you literally, you'd have to go out. If you hadn't played there, you wouldn't know this stuff. You know, I had never played in Boston Garden. You know, I just saw it on TV and I just thought it was like the, the, the Mecca, this, the, you know, like this, the, this museum. And literally it was a museum. It, it really was. <laughs> really? In the wow. Tent. But yeah, so those are the things that for me, looking back, I was really excited about because, you know, we were kids, you, you knew who all these great players were and the history of these organizations and, so I was just really more pumped about that. I think all of our guys in that rookie class were excited to be in the NBA and, and just uh, ready to start that journey. Yeah, it was a good draft class. I, know. I, I had a look back earlier on. And any any favorite memories of playing against Orlando? Uh, I think it was Shaq's rookie year. Uh, we went down and obviously, you know, Shaq was like, because Shaq and I played against each other in college. Uh, when he was with Stanley Roberts and Chris Jackson, uh, at the time was Chris Jackson. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we, we knew each other and we used to just tease Patrick because I think Shaq dunked on Patrick one time really hard, knocked him down. And, you know, Shaq, you know, had fun with it. And so we were kind of rib. Pat Patrick didn't like that, like at all. And he was really pissed about it. Uh, and so you could, <laughs> we, 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 we could be passive aggressive with like, giving him a hard time about it. You know, like we, we be talking to one another where we knew he could hear. It's like, damn, man, that's Shaq. That's a bad boy. Do you see that play? Do you see what he did to Patrick? And Patrick would not like that, which we wanted him to get mad because he played back. Yeah. Uh, and, and we ended up winning that game. But, but those kinds of moments uh, really stood out. We had such an intense group because of rally. And we really were on edge all the time. Like it was, it was like, it's hard to explain, but you never felt comfortable around there because, like, he kept you on edge all the time. He made everything competitive, uh, and, and I just remember that. Now, we won a lot, and it was fun, 
but not everybody was comfortable in that environment. And so uh, moments like that really stood out, playing them, playing against Jack. Uh, and then when Penny got there, because I had seen Penny a lot in, in college, uh, they were they were amazing. I still look back on them losing that championship. And, and it's not to blame anybody, but you think about how everything changed when Nick Anderson misses those free throws. Yeah. You know, it, it really set that. I think they win that series if they win that game. Uh, he doesn't. They don't. And he was a great player and still a great player, but I think it psychologically affected him as well moving forward. He was never quite the same. And then obviously Shaq leaves, Penny gets hurt, the whole nine. So uh, that was kind of the beginning of the end in that regard until they got to Dwight. So, uh uh, or T-Mac, I should say. But they, they had some some good runs. Uh, it's been a really good organization overall in terms of how they run it. They just haven't had good fortune, uh, really, if you think about it here, late in terms of the rebuild. And hopefully this front office, though, looks like from a draft standpoint, they've done a little bit better job than the last one. Yeah. And uh, yeah. that that's critical for a small market team. You, you've got to hit some home runs in the draft. Uh, nobody hits them all, but you got to hit a few to have a chance to to give your fan base some excitement and some optimism and yeah. to be relevant. Yeah. yeah. So, Greg, as Mike, Mike, you mentioned, you've played for a number of great teams during your career. Um, not, not a number of great teams. Not a number of great teams. I played for a number <laughs> of teams. <laughs> so, <laughs> not all of them great. <laughs> well, the Sonics were pretty good as well, weren't they? <laughs> yeah, there were some stinkers. Yeah, um, but what was it like going up against some of those magic greats you've just uh, mentioned there? Obviously, Penny, Nick, Scott Skiles, uh, to name but a few. Did you what? What did you learn from playing against uh, those type of players? Uh, they were great. Scott Skiles was just an absolute competitor. Uh, hated the guy, absolutely hated him because <laughs> he was such a prick on the court. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in a prick in a good way, right? Like you would love to have a guy like that as a teammate. Yeah, uh, and, and we did. Like he was kind of like their John Starks in terms of just the attitude and the way he approached it. And he was a tough sob. So you, you, I learned the importance of that because a lot he was like a lot of the great ones mentally. Like that's how Stockton was. That's how Isaiah. Those guys were tough sobs, man. Uh, and he would talk a little more than some of the other guys. Uh, and I didn't realize it at the time, but he was doing it more for himself than he was to try to affect you. Uh, but he was he was phenomenal. Penny was incredible. Penny was Penny had a chance to probably go down as one of, if not the best uh, big point guard. Ever. Like he was on that trajectory. Uh, I tell friends because like this is where basketball reference and all the history and, and to be able to go and have perspective. Right. You know, Penny was first team all NBA his second year. That's really hard to do. That that you have to be beyond special, you know, to to be become first team All NBA in your second year. You know that that I, I don't think you can even say anything. You just look at some of the great players, the all time greats. Uh, you look at LeBron. You look at Kobe, uh, Michael, a lot of these guys, and you don't see a lot of guys being first team All NBA in their second year. And so like, he was an incredible talent, an amazing feel. He, and the thing about him, I'm like, even magic at his size, he could actually, he's kind of like Durant was is today. Like he could actually beat smaller guards off the grip, yeah. which, you know, you don't see from guys six, eight, six, nine, but he was that quick, had that electric of a handle. Uh, he was one of the best young players I'd ever had the pleasure of going up against. That's cool. amazing. Thank you. So, Greg, I believe you were 24 when you were drafted in 91. Is that 91? Right? I, I was going to be 24. I was turning okay. 24 that year, yes. Okay. Yes. And obviously you spent three, four years playing in college, playing college yes. basketball. How difficult do you feel like it is for one and dones making that transition from college to the pros now with only one year? And yeah. how do you feel Cole's one year playing for the Tar Heels helped him prepare playing for the playing for the NBA? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it, it's obviously getting easier as a one and done. A lot of this is mindset. Um, and that's where it's 
it, it'll swallow some guys and they'll struggle because they don't, they've never really struggled before, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think what happened for, from Cole's perspective is, you know, he got hurt. He had a horrible freshman year in Carolina uh, and he didn't handle it well. He'll, he'll tell you, like, we, we talk about it. That, that really put him, the, the, the advantage of that is that had he not had that kind of a year, he wouldn't be in Orlando. Yeah. You know, and so, and I told him big picture, you know, I was in a lot of ways, the best thing to happen to you. Uh, so him having those struggles actually helped him. Uh, whereas had he had, you know, a great year and everything went well, uh, I think it would have been harder. He didn't have the high expectations either uh, externally. He had them, but not externally. You know, uh, you juxtapose that to what Jalen Suggs is going through this year. Like he had the high expectations, you know, they gave him the keys to the car early on. And sometimes, man, now you go from, in his case, he played on a really good team. You know, three other pros on that team. Uh, they didn't lose a lot. The game's easier, the better your team, because you get better shots. You know, you know, you're, you're a lot of advantages. And so then you go from that to this level um, and it doesn't happen right away. The game's a lot faster. Uh, the guys are bigger, stronger, smarter. Uh, and so that transition, man, can be a challenge. And you've seen it. You, you saw it last year with all the, all the, the one and done guys. It took them a while. You, you're seeing it this year. Typically what you look for, though, is with young players, you're looking for them to show you their ceiling. You're looking for three or four games where, they, where it clicks and you can say, okay, that's who he's got a chance to be. And so that's yeah. – that's what's important. And then what you do from that, you say, okay, how does that fit with the other guys that we have? And, and so that's, that's a big part of it. These guys are also mentally. Um, and I, I can, I speak from my perspective with my son. Um, they are a lot more confident. There's a more of a belief. Like we would have never thought about turning pro as a sophomore in high school or a junior in high school. Like, yeah, you you were hoping to play in college. Um, heck, in my junior year, I could have turned pro. I uh, would have been a first rounder, but like no desire to go to go to the league. Whereas guys today, they actually that's the only desire is to go. They're not thinking about college per se, and and they're also much further along in their preparation because they get more coaching and exposure to compete against high level talent than we did back when I was a kid. So that helps them, but you still have to experience it. And you've seen it with all of them. And eventually they start to figure it out. And some guys, it takes a little longer. Um, some guys don't, you know, that's just the reality, the nature of, of the draft. You go back and look at the history of the NBA draft. Half the guys never make it. They, they just don't. I mean, we had a guy, uh, I think Phoenix had the 10th pick this year. They didn't even pick up the fourth year option on their guy, you know, right. which is unheard of. Yeah. Um, but the, the fact that they felt that he just wasn't ready, that says a lot because it's also an indictment on you as a front office when you, yeah, when you don't commit to a guy. So, like, it's a challenge, man. And, and some of it you got to be lucky. And the one thing that oftentimes you can't see is what's the mindset like? You know, does the guy have a chance to be great? Does he want to be great? Uh, can we win with them? You know, you got a lot of that stuff comes into it. And, you know, sometimes guys get caught up too much in the physical makeup. But at this level, man, it's more about your mental mindset and your mental makeup. And that's where you're going to see some of these guys really continue to excel. Uh, and then some guys might not be ready, you know, for it. And so that that's only time will tell. The beauty for the magic is looks like our guys mentally are built the right way. Um, they want to be really good. They want to compete at this level. And uh, I, I think they're heading in that direction. And you can see that when like the Lakers game last night, when you're getting down by by 20 odd points and, and they're not, they're not giving up. They, they keep fighting, uh -huh. don't they? Yeah, they did. And they, they'll continue to fight. I mean, that, that quarter was, I was talking to Cole after I, he's like, yeah, I, I was like, man, that's probably the worst quarter you guys have had. This season, yeah. I and mean, he quickly reminded me, he said, yeah, that one and the one against Boston. Because I had completely forgot about that, but he doesn't, he remembers all that stuff. And so yeah. he I was like, yes, good point. But that that was, you know, I mean, even that game, it was 
we had three solid quarters, yep. you know, um, and that's what you, you know, as a fan of a rebuild, you got to look at stuff like that, yep. you know, and you got to also accept the fact that, you know, we're competing with in essence, half a roster, you know, like it's not, you know, we're not bad. We're just not as good as the best teams. If our roster were healthy, we'd absolutely. Now, I'm basing that on where our guys are that are playing, right? And that's my point earlier about Franz. The reality, though, is had Fultz and Isaac been out there, who's to say that Franz gets to show this and gets to where he is now? It, it, we might not have seen this till next year. And so, like, that's the one advantage of having all those injuries. We've gotten to identify and allow guys to kind of grow and mature. Uh, Wendell Carter Jr. is like is like that as well. You know, he's taking a step. Uh, and so there's been so many positive signs with this group uh, that it makes it it makes it a lot more fun to see. Uh, and they and they still believe like they're not down on themselves. They're still excited. They're living their best life. They're playing in the NBA. Uh, they don't feel the pressure to have to be great today, but they're all working towards getting better. So it, it's I, I even watch the game with a different perspective because I typically when I watch a game, it's all based on why you won and why you lost uh, as an analyst. But with this, I, I have to watch it differently. And it's about I tell Cole, I was like, look, you're going to school. I've like I said, you're going to get a master class tonight. And it's about seeing what they do and why they're really good and figuring out, can you do it? And so like, that's the, be one of the first things he'll say. We talk after every game. And I remember after golden state, she liked him. And he's like, he's like, damn, he's like, man, that's elite. They're really good. He's like, I want to play like that. I feel like I can do that. You know? And like, that's his mindset. And, and that's what you want from guys. Like you don't be overwhelmed or in awe of what you see. You just, see it and figure out, can I be it? Can I do that? Yeah. And so when the way he responds and stuff like that, like I, we talked a lot about, you always got to be honest with yourself and be in touch with what you're feeling. And so those kinds of moments are really critical. Like in two or three years, we won't remember that those kinds of situations. Cause I, I think we'll be well beyond that, but like, Early on, that's how you learn. Like, you can't be overwhelmed or down on yourself, man. You're just like, okay, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And so that's why we talk a lot about you for him. Hey, you base everything on wins and losses. Like, why we lost, you know, what we need to do better, what could we have done better? Because that's how you get better at this level, especially when you're in the midst of a rebuild. I was, well, I was going to say that the 10 minute period that they had in that third quarter as a development team. Yeah, as fans, you don't want to see it. But as a, as a team developing, there is a huge learning tool to be had from that 10 minutes. Sit down with that video and they, they there's there's a lot to be learned from it. And let's be fair, had one or two of those shots dropped that they had in that period of time, the momentum would have been completely different. And I think we'd have been talking about a different result. Yeah, possibly, you're 100% right. And some of it too was like, we didn't... Uh we didn't have a lot of quality possessions in that stretch yeah. and, and they made us pay. Cause even in the first half, we got away with, we had 11 turnovers. They only scored five points and that's the strength of their game yeah. is turning your turnovers into points. Cause if they get no support, they're dangerous. So we actually did a really good job and you got to factor in. We played the day before, yeah. you know, yeah, we're young and the whole nine, but those kids, they're out in LA. This is the last game of a long trip. Uh, mentally, you can start seeing yourself going home. And so our kids fought in that first half to give ourselves a chance. Uh, and in the third quarter, listen, they got two top 75 players on the on the floor, even without Anthony Davis, right? Like, so it's not like you're uh, getting beat by a team you're better than. They just, they, they got a lesson and they'll learn from valuing each possession and that's part of the process, too, is like when you got young guys, young players are always trying to prove how good they are. And oftentimes when you're trying to prove that, it doesn't necessarily correlate with playing winning basketball. Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of those possessions in that third quarter where we kind of got away from what we were doing well. And we had 
a lot of guys that they weren't. They were just trying to make a play. And it didn't oftentimes end in a, in a good look for our team. And so those are, in a lot of ways for uh, Coach Mosley, that, that's a good experience to have because it allows you to teach better. You know, when, yep. you, when you get have those, now you got that on film, man. Now you can go and see all the other things we could have done within those possessions. And so, you know, you, you live and learn. Um, they'll come back today. They'll have a tough one tomorrow night against uh, Atlanta, and that'll be a really tough game because that first game home after a long road trip, the teams tend to not play well. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they respond to that game because Atlanta, very good team, but we're getting to a point now where even with all the injuries, this group, they're good enough to beat people. Yeah. If we play well, like we could have played well early in the season and still not be able to win games. We're kind of getting to a point now where if you look at it, we lose it by two in Houston. Other than Golden State, we based even even the game last night, we, we got blasted yeah. but one quarter. You know, we got we get outscored by 26 in one quarter in the game we lose by what 12? 12. 12. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that means for three quarters, you know, we're we're right there. And then obviously the Clipper game. We could have very easily won. So, like, the guys are now at least in games, you know, and that's a the best way to learn is to play tough games where you got to execute in the fourth quarter offensively and defensively. That's where the most growth comes from. And we're finally now getting to a point where we're in games, and that's where you start to develop an identity of, of who we are and how we play. So, Craig, um, Cole's positivity and attitude is something we love as Magic fans. Uh, the way he carries himself and conducts himself, uh, but also his celebrations and, and you know, the way he is in his uh, post-game interviews, like we've probably seen with Dante. Um, yeah. Tell us of your emotions as a father, seeing your son hit two game winners in his rookie season um, and just comment on the way, you know, he carries himself, uh, you know, in day-to-day life. Well, it was, it's beyond awesome to see those experiences for him. Uh, you know, especially because the journey, like, you know, Cole has such a narrative after his freshman year that was negative uh, and there was not a lot he could do about it because he did have a bad year. Uh, But he never lost sight of who he was and what his goals were. Um, He never, you know, he got down on himself. Don't get me wrong. He absolutely did. But he never gave into it, you know. And so... You know, when you finally see him, because that year he had had a lot of struggles in his rookie year as well, you know, and then he got thrown in after, unfortunately, Markel goes down with the uh, with the torn ACL. So he had a lot of bumps in his road. But then when you and we talked about what you want to see from guys is how they perform, you know, over the course of they're going to show you four or five times what their ceiling is. And so when he had those shots and the way they transpired, because if you think about the first one against Minnesota, he, the ball just came to him and he just went down and sneakily, he knocks down the three. The next time to show you how things change, they designed the play for him. Yeah. Yeah. And so mentally as a player, your coach just told you, I believe in you. We believe you can be one of those guys. And so, that gives you a lot of confidence. Not as if it's not that he didn't that, that he lacked confidence, but it's another thing when that the coaching staff is instilling it in you. Or, or and so so that was a really big one. And so as a dad, you're watching that man, and you're just blown away. And I'm trying to remember. I think I was in studio when he did the one against Minnesota, yeah. and so that was really cool because you do like I'm working, but I got my league pass up and I'm watching it. And I end up, I think I hit the table and I go, yes, or something. <laughs> and they videotape this too, which is funny because the uh, my producer, because they, they know, like, and they'll be videotaping and they'll run it back during the show. And, and, and it's it's cool because it is unfiltered and it's, you know, it's just a dad, you know, enjoying yeah. something that his son is doing. And uh, so it was a really cool experience. Uh, and I really felt like it started to propel him to allow him to get back to what he had been, you know, for basically his entire life as a basketball player. And so that was a great, great experience and a great feeling as a dad. I've, I've, I've had to, after last night's game, I took a little look at his, at his stats. Uh, 24th in points per game and 20th in free throw percentage. Um, all 
all of his stats are up from rookie season. Should Cole be seeing more love nationally? Uh, yeah, because of the way that situation is. Like, you know, there's a little bit of talk about him being most improved. And then the naysayers will say, well, you know, second year players are supposed to improve. And there's truth to that. But also you got to have perspective. Generally, I would agree with that when you're a top five pick, mm. you know, because when you're a top five pick, first of all, you generally, they give you the keys to the car. They let you go out and be aggressive. There is no uh, recourse for mistakes. They're just going to let you figure it out. And they want, cause they want to see, you know, what you can ultimately be uh, in his case. You know, he was drafted to be a backup. Uh, he only started because someone got hurt. Yeah. And and not to mention, like, and then you're going to also have the other aspect of that where guys are going to improve just based on minutes. Um, but the difference is, in his case, the minutes are up, but everything is up. He's yeah. far more efficient. Uh, and, I, you know, what gets lost in this, I was reading some Zach Lowe wrote it, and I was – really thrilled that they even acknowledged him nationally. He's had a couple times now where he's at least gotten some national attention. You tend to don't get that in a small market when you're five and 2020, right? So we, we do understand. Uh, but, you know, if you look at what he's doing historically, and this is what, go look at his second year, compare him to the best guards in the league. And if you notice, a lot of them, he's actually ahead of them. Yep. The average fan has no idea of this. His, and, and, and it's because of narrative. Because if this had been LaMelo or Anthony Edwards, you'd be raving about how great they are. You, they don't get nitpicked. Because when you're 21, you're supposed to focus on the positives. You know, Cole is not playing his best basketball. Cole's a 20-point scorer in the NBA. And he doesn't know how to score yet. We had this conversation wow. the other day, he and I. Like, it's wow. true. We're 21. What do you think he's going to be in two or three years? Like, it's not like he's like playing the best he's going to ever play. He did something in the game against Sacramento that he's never done before. He he came off a pick and roll and he pumped it. And the guy flew by and he knocked down. He did it twice. He had never done that in the NBA. Not one time. He'd never done that. And like, I see that because, again, I'm I'm watching every possession and I've seen his journey. But, like, what people don't understand is, like, guys don't get worse when they want to be great. Like, you're not seeing his best basketball. You're just seeing his trajectory. If you go back prior to his freshman year, this is what Cole was projected to be before the injury. He was in the same. He was one of the top two or three kids in the entire class. Um, if you Even as bad as his year was at, at North Carolina, Go look at the numbers. It was no different than Anthony Edwards' numbers. Yep. Same numbers. And Same he shooting up. percentages. He actually shot it higher from three. But if you look at the numbers, go look at what he shot off the, th off the dribble on three. Like, he didn't get the shot quality because the team, unfortunately, wasn't as good. So that narrative carried forward yep. on him. So people knocked him for it. Uh, you know, and so, like, they didn't. So he ends up as a 15th pick. Now, the beauty of that is if you if you keep that same perspective, now he should be at the forefront for, for most improved because of how his numbers have jumped. And again, it's not like people say, well, you know, when you're on a bad team, your numbers, are, that's there, there is truth to that, but not when you're efficient on a bad team yeah. because he's a focal point typically of the opposing defense now. And he's yeah. already getting over 20 points. And in this league, yeah. like you said, there's only 24 other guys doing that. You know, I know. I think. I think I know the answer. But I'm going to ask you. I, I certainly think so. Do you think we'll see him in an All Star game at some point? Yeah, Cole. Cole yeah. doesn't just want to be an All Star. Cole wants to be an All Time great. Like, and you see this with guys. He doesn't talk this way, which I'm glad he doesn't. He will let you know what he thinks of himself, but he's not one to say, "Hey, look at me." He he will always defer to his teammates. Always. Credit them because he and he yeah. genuinely means that. If you watch a game, even when he was hurt, he's the first one off the bench cheering for guy. He like genuinely, he's in love with basketball, and he's in love with winning. And so he understands where he is. He knows it's going to be a challenge for him, uh, but he doesn't lack confidence. And, and 
Cole's not going to just be an all star. Cole's going to be an all NBA player potentially. If, if you know, but for injury, he'll be he'll have a chance. You know, we talked about this the other day. I said, listen, in three years, Dame, Steph, and Chris Paul, who are the standard bearers for that position, you know, they they might still all be in the league, but they're not going to be the standard bearers. Yeah, you know, they'll be on their coronation tour at that point. Um, still can play good basketball, just like we see with LeBron playing great basketball late in his career. Yeah. Like that, I'm not saying it won't, but it'll be the guys who are up next. And and I said that you go look at the top guys now. You look at the Trey Youngs, the Ja Morants. Um, you know, I guess the Aaron Fox is in that conversation. I think Lamelo, Darius Garland, Cole doesn't have to take a backseat to any of those guys. You know, like. If you break down his skill set and what he does, you know, I always laugh. People, you read this stuff because I read it. I keep it. So he, you know, say, so, oh, you know, he's not, a, he'll get penalized. They'll say, well, he's not a great passer because he's a great scorer. But then if you go look at the numbers, all the guys that are supposed to be these great passers. I don't, I've never heard anybody knock Steph Curry or Damian Lillard. They're not, they don't pass it like Chris Paul. But you don't have to be Chris Paul to be a really good passer. You just got to be able to make all the plays. Yeah. And his jump shot and ability to score will create opportunities for him to be a really good passer. So, like, that that stuff's there. That, that what I'll be anxious to see, too, is will his team recognize how good he can be and in what direction are they going to go in terms of how they build? Because you, your best player, if he ends up being that, and I don't know. Listen, I, I think Kel's really good. I think Suggs is going to be really good. We want to get uh, Jonathan Isaac back to see what his ceiling is. Franz is going to – all these guys are going to continue to get better. Um, but you also, when you identify, okay, who's going to be our guide, and then we got to build around that guy. We got to build a team where these guys complement each other. Um, and so that's what we'll, we'll wait to see how that all transpires. Because it is – it's hard sometimes when the expectation is one thing – and then you're doing another because that narrative's got to change. That narrative hasn't changed yet. Like generally, guys, his numbers are actually exactly the same as Kyrie the year Kyrie went to the All Star game for the first time. And Kyrie was in his third seat. He's doing that, as, and, and Kyrie's team wasn't good. Now I'm not saying he deserves to be an All Star because he doesn't. The point I'm making is if if you true, looked at true. him as a franchise caliber player, yeah, because. That's what he's doing. Like mm. he's getting twenty six and six pretty efficiently across the board. How many guys are doing that? You know, like like to say, well, it's a bad team. Like that'd be like saying, well, they're losing because of Cole, which is kind of foolish. Like they Nonsense. they start the yeah. youngest team in the history of the NBA. It's yeah. the youngest team with no no depth. Yeah, you know, and like, you look at what that youngest <laughs> team were doing as a starting unit, the, the the position that they were in, as far as figures for this year's NBA goes, yeah. they were playing some brilliant basketball. It's, it's been exactly as you just said there, the depth. It's actually going to bring me on to something I want to ask you about because it's when we've started rotating some of the players out that the, the team started to struggle on, with the bench unit. Uh, there's been online grumbling from some Magic fans around RJ and Schumer. I personally think RJ's improved. Um, Schumer had a very disturbed summer uh, through missing the back end of the season last year and then the start of this. How difficult is it and what impact will it have had for Tuma to come back in sort of 10, 15 games into the season having missed so much? It's extremely difficult. And I'm glad you, you, you bring that up, Paul, because like what people don't understand is not only did he not have training camp, it's a new system with new players. Yep. And so everything's changed for him too. So, you know, guys that were in different spots a season ago in a different system are no longer in those situations. So it's going to take him a while. And it's not like he was a guy that's played a lot the last two years. Yep. He didn't play his rookie year. Yep. Right. So then last year, it's similar situation. He had to get work back into the fold in a completely different situation where they weren't, the expectation was a playoff team. So he had to go through that. Then you bring in, obviously with the two draft picks, those guys are going to be 
push to the front of the line because you've invested a lot of money in them and you've got to see and they deserve that that they've earned that right so that makes the challenge difficult for him um but in time it'll get better the other thing in rj's case rj's improved a tremendous amount like the other thing that gets lost is they're asking uh, rj to do things that he doesn't do well rj's not a point guard so like the first thing you learn in sports you don't ask guys to do things they don't do well you know, you, you tend to always want to put guys in a position of comfort because now they can they can figure it out. So for him to basically have to play backup point guard, he doesn't want to do that. You know, it. so in some respects, it'll help him because he'll learn the value of basketball more and he'll he'll learn to like, OK, I don't have to hit the home run every play because that's what happens. Like the game is starting to slow down for RJ and Schuma, but it hasn't yet. And like that's like when you hear players talk about, you know, you know, it's starting to slow down for them. That means that they're processing information faster. And when you process faster, you play more on instinct, you become faster, you become more athletic, you become more confident. The worst thing that can happen for an athlete is to have to think about what they're doing. And so with some of our young guys, they're still having to think. And that's a recipe for disaster. And the only way you get out of that is through habit and opportunity and reps. And so those guys will get better. Um, it's just unfortunate. Like, we're, you know, it really is. Like, nobody's lost the amount of games we've lost in injury. And, and let's not even talk about J.I. and Markel. We, Michael Carter-Williams hadn't played a game. Yep. Antoine Moore hasn't played a game. Those guys would be invaluable to this team right now. You know, Jalen's out now. He's missed, what, six, seven games. Cole missed six. You know, that's a lot to overcome when you got a young team where none of these guys had really had a lot of success in the NBA yet. So it, it's a challenge for them. And I just hope fans understand, like, based on that, you take the top two players coming into the season. I think I tweeted this out. Like, our top – most people thought that Kel – and Jonathan Isaac were the two best players on the roster. And that's a fair assumption. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think anybody could argue that. You go through the NBA, and you go take the two best players off any roster and see how many wins they have. They're going to struggle because it's a domino effect. It doesn't just affect not having those two. Now you have to go and figure out ways to get other guys. into. Look, look at Denver. They got the MVP in the league. They took their they they lost their second and third best player. They're nowhere well, that's, near. Uh, that's struggling. Yeah, and, that, and that's what yeah. their second and third relative. And, and I would argue we're probably that right now I would say two of our three best players haven't played a game this year with with those two because I do think Jonathan, you know, defensively he'll be a great fit for us. You know, because we don't have a, a high motor athlete with a defensive mindset. Um, and, and, and that guy will erase a lot of our mistakes, you know, defensively, because he can cover a lot of ground. Now it's going to take him time to get up to speed, but we'll be infinitely better. Having Markel, who's another guy that can make plays, that can play with pressure, uh, you know, like those will, those will be big. And technically we should have that, you know, by the end of January. That's why I feel like we'll be, we'll be better. So in a lot of ways, best thing to have in the Magic is those guys being out. Because we might not have this conversation about Franz. Franz got a legit chance to be rookie of the year. Like he's moved, just, he's in that yeah. conversation. He he they the, the whole Orlando PR uh, department starts pushing that narrative because that's a big part of this is narrative. That's all this stuff's about. Like you got to push that because if it's spoken enough, people start to buy into it. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and Franz is having an incredible start to his year. Incredible start. You know, with where he is and what he's been able to do. And remember, again, he's being asked to do things that no one thought he was going to be doing. Yeah. He's a he's a secondary ball handler on our team right now. He's the backup point guard as well. And he's still got a score. And he's got you a just you just jumped into the next question before I even asked it, Greg. Um I was just gonna say, um, you play with Detlef Schrem in Seattle. What similarities do you see between uh, France, obviously German, same as uh, Schrem? Yeah. And how, how similar are their games? Very similar in terms of their versatility. 
great size for a perimeter player. Um, I would say Franz is, and this is no disrespect, because Detlef, one, he's a great friend of mine, incredible basketball player, because I played against Detlef when he was with the Pacers, too. So before we became teammates, he was a terrific player. Franz is, I don't want to say light years out of respect, but Franz is on path to be a much better player. In part because he's also a terrific defender. He's a terrific, like Franz's lateral quickness, his instincts, and his ability to use his hands defensively. And he's a tough SOB. Like he he likes to compete. He's he's got a chance. I said it's like he'll be a he'll be an all-star. Like you have some guys in our league, um, their team makes them an all-star. Not that they aren't really good. They are, because you yeah. you gotta be good, but winning will determine, you know, I'll give you an example. Andrew Wiggins will be an all-star this year because of their record. Not necessarily because of the stats, but because of their record. Um, and he's a focal point on that team. And Franz initially will be that kind of – Chris Middleton was like that. Yeah. You know, we, we look at Chris Middleton now in a completely yeah. different fight because he's won a championship and now he's gone and got a gold medal. So whereas before we looked at him as a complimentary player, now we look at him as a star. And Franz has got that kind of a makeup because at the end of the day, too, you got to be able to do all those other things, but you got to be able to put the ball in the basket. Like you, you can be, a, you can do all those things. Rudy Gobert is a great defender, but if they couldn't score, we wouldn't be talking about Rudy Gobert, right? Yeah. Because at the end of yeah. the day, you got to have guys that can that can score against like the best players can score against great defense when you get in the playoffs and the game slows down and you're playing late in the shot clock you got to have guys that can make plays against pressure and Franz is going to be one of those guys like like I tell like when you when you see the stuff that he can do at this age and that was my point about series he's already had 28 point games you know, he's already had games where he's had five assists five rebounds you know, he he's like those. That's how you judge a young player. It's not by their floor. It's by their ceiling. It's they show you what they can be in this league. Like and then you look at are they wired for it? Franz is wired for it, man. Franz is Franz is going to have a chance to be real. like they've got. And this is with all due respect to everybody else. They've got two foundational pieces that I'm telling you, you could take. Those two young guys at 21 and 20, and you can put them up against any other duo in the NBA at that age. Any of them. And they're right there because they are as complete offensively as anybody. Yep. Um, they both compete defensively. And when you put the right pieces around those guys, and as they learn to make better decisions, man, they're going to be scary. They re they're really going to be scary uh, big picture. Uh, I'm excited for to just watching their growth. I really am. Yeah. Well, Greg, we could do this all afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could do this all afternoon. Um, but we're, we're, uh, we're conscious of the time and we'll, we'll let you go. But we just want to say thank you very much for uh, yeah. taking the cho time to join us. Yeah. Um, Every Magic fan loves the fact that you're you're very engaged with everybody on Twitter. So uh, we love hearing your perspective. And obviously, we've heard a little bit more of that uh, today. Hopefully, we can get you on as another guest sometime down oh, the road. Absolutely. absolutely, man. I'm a big fan What's of you that? guys. It is does the heart uh, well to, to listen to you guys because you are the you're what I hope all fans are. You're optimistic. You have perspective about the big picture. It's yeah. going to be a process. But you're starting to see what these guys can be. Like the, the fact that they're doing it at this level and they're doing it for the most part pretty efficiently. I mean, that 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 should bode really well. Like this team, and they're gonna have do they have two first rounders next year or just one? I think it's just one, one next, next year, year. two the just following, one, two the following yeah. year. So yeah. so like the future is extremely <laughs> bright. And I do give sometimes you gotta get fortunate. Um, they, they got fortunate to get Cole with a 15th pick. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then, and then Jeff Wellman and, and, and him, those guys did a great job with the boots trade that turns into Franz. Cause Aaron Gordon, who I really like, just doesn't have the ceiling that Franz has, you know, Franz is going to be a 20 point scorer in this league. 
That's and as you guys know, that's hard. There ain't a lot of them. He's going to be a twenty point scorer in this league, and so if you can draft a guy like that in the with your second first round pick, that that really bodes well moving forward. Yeah, I think it's true to say we are all excited by the future for this this squad. Um, yeah. None of us are going to be over this year, but I know that we're all looking at being over for next season for for seeing some games. And I think to sit down and actually watch these guys in person will be an amazing experience. Yeah, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Hopefully, we'll get to maybe pop a pop a drink or two when you guys uh, when you guys get over. Absolutely, absolutely. Like We'd be plan. more than happy for the invite. That'd be <laughs> Open invitation. I only live about two and a half hours from Orlando, so I go up a lot. Like uh, I, I'm probably going to go up Wednesday. I got to be in Atlanta Thursday, but Grant Hill lives in Orlando, so I'm going to go up and watch the game with him Wednesday night, and then head to work. So uh, yeah, I'm up there a lot. I'm up there a lot, man. We nice. it's great city. We're you guys should be really excited. I'm excited, your Magic fans, and uh, it's going to be a fun journey. Listen, you're going to have a hell of a ride for the rest of the season. I guarantee you, this team, Markel's practicing. He's close. You know, hopefully Isaac's going to be close, and I, I think we're going to make a lot of noise in the second half of the season. I like Amazing. it. Amazing. Well, I'm fired up just listening to Greg for yeah. the last half an hour. An hour so, uh, I can't wait for Wednesday now. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Good stuff. Excellent. Well, thank you as always for uh, listening and watching. We'll be recording our next episode on Thursday, the 13th of December. Uh, we're going to break down the two games against the uh, Clippers, Lakers and Wednesday's game against the Hawks. Uh, for the latest news, visit our website, orlandomagicuk.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter and YouTube. All of our links are in the description. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Uh, comment, leave us your comments, questions. We love to hear from you guys and from Garrett, Paul and me until next time. Go magic.